Hello, my name is Alan Williams. I'm a creative director at a company called Imaginary Forces. We are in New York and LA. We've been around for about 20 years. And you know, our goal is to use cutting edge design to tell evocative storytelling, whether it's through commercials or main titles or experiential design, interactive design. So for us, that's, you know, that's a fun, exciting challenge. Uh, one of those topics you know, is through main title design. So through the years, um, these are some of the more recognizable ones. Sometimes title design is uh, more graphic based, graphic design based like that with Mad Men. Other times it's more with computer CG, such as this with black cells. Other times it's more live action with Boardwalk Empire, if you've seen the, the title. Uh, the recent uh, Netflix Jessica Jones, where it's a painterly aesthetic. Um, and then the, the popular famous one, Stranger Things, which is just gorgeous, immersive type, right? So for us, the t uh, uh, what I wanted to talk about today, which was a huge challenge uh, for me, which I feel like speaks to a lot of, of this idea of making people feel something, is a title for HBO's Vinyl. Now, the reason why this was a huge challenge for me, well, let me stop this for a second. The reason why this was a huge challenge for us is because we were being approached by um, we were being asked to create this kind of evocative 1970s representation of the 1970s music rock scene. And how are you supposed to kind of uh, to, to do that in 90 seconds, something so big and vast? And, and my first person that I had to pitch this to was, uh, you know, Scorsese and Mick Jagger. Like, these are lead characters in the 1970s rock movement. I wasn't even born in the 70s. So it was quite the challenge to be able to create something that actually was supposed to move these guys. So I'm gonna start off with showing you the title and then I'm gonna go through and break down some of these larger conceptual design themes that have helped me, helps, helps me along the way with coming up with, uh, with concepts. Cool, so the first idea I wanna talk about for us when we're having to come up with these creative concepts and to pitch to these people is this phrase I was thinking about method branding. We've all heard about method acting and, and I recently talked to an editor, he even talked about method editing. But this is the idea that whenever you're having this client that you're supposed to talk to and supposed to understand, getting outside of your world, your vision, your box, and first of all, taking on their vision, and first of all, understanding exactly what makes them tick and their brand tick. And that's a very difficult thing, especially like I said before, where someone like myself never grew up in the, uh, you know, in the 70s. So, you know, we have these three guys that, that we're meeting with and talking with, and clearly, like for me, just like if you're pitching for trying to represent a brand like Pepsi or anything else, this goal of taking something as large as that movement needs to, first of all, we first of all need to understand and really absorb what these guys understood it to be. Because they lived it. I mean, he, you know, Jagger was like a main character in that. So it requires tons and tons of research. And I don't have a lot of time when I sit down and talk to these showrunners. Uh, you, you guys may have similar results when you, when you talk to clients. So it's super important. Anytime I pitch on anything, I always have my, my phone. I'm recording every single thing that that person says. And I analyze it. I get, 
I get off the phone with them after I've read their scripts, and I totally try to understand the vision and the voice that makes up this, this show. And that's a tricky thing, I feel like, as designers or as communicators. It's, tr it's constantly trying to understand, first and foremost, before we implement all of our grand designs and visions, what this, first of all, this brand represents, right? So that's, that's what I always typically do at the beginning. I, t I do tons and tons of research, and that's me and I worked alongside of uh, Michelle Dory, Dory of the LA, uh, LA office and Jessica Ledoux, our editor, and we just began to break down and study these different images from the 70s and exactly what was going on in that time. We found these really interesting backstage moments behind at the venues here in New York City and the energy and the life. And here, like even in my pitch book, you know, not knowing that Jagger is later going to look at this, I had him in there. You know, it's, it's quite, it's quite an interesting thing when you're, when you're pitching to someone like that. But that's what you have to do. You have to take that moment when you speak to them, understand it, and carry it with you way beyond just that day. One grand thing that I've learned through the years is find a song. I mean, this may be more for filmmakers or more for motion design, but like find a song that en encapsulates that vision of that piece, of that message. And I literally, I listen to it on repeat when I'm on the subway. I constantly try to get into the mind, into the head of this client, of this brand. So that's a huge thing for me. Before I ever press on and try to do anything creative on my own, I need to understand, first of all, what I'm dealing with, you know, what I'm supposed to represent. And the second thing is collect and curate. And you've heard, you've heard this a lot, but this idea of living a lifestyle of observation. People ask me when I go to schools, you know, what, what, how do you come up with these ideas? How do you come up with this creative? And I always say, it never comes from nothing. It always comes from something else. And once you understand that, that these creative concepts and creative solutions come from something else, you can become, you begin to develop this lifestyle of doing very strategic type collecting and curating. I'm constantly, this side up here, like Pinterest has been a game changer for me. I know you can use it for, for anything, but for me I have hundreds of these boards where I'm constantly procrastinating productively on the internet, right? If I'm going to like Tumblr or some type of photo blog, I'm always in the back of my mind knowing that I'm going to take an image and I'm going to send it and collect it in one of these folders. And at the end of the day, I can literally point to job folders and say, that won me that commercial, or that folder won me that title sequence, because you're, you're becoming a curator of life. Now, it doesn't have to be in, on the web. It can be with your iPhone, right? When you're, you hear some, a song on the subway, you can re constantly record audio, constantly writing down what inspires you. That's really important. We literally take our environment, our office space, and do that type of, of, uh, of curating. So this is inside of Jessica Ledoux's edit suite. This is one of the walls. This is where we were studying and looking at all the different fashion, all the different clothing, the different types of tone and mood of that day. We we're literally just putting it up on the wall, saturating our life, getting as deep into it as we can into the 1970s rock movement. Uh, so as we started doing this, we started to, f to realize and come to this conclusion that like, you know, the 70s was really this moment of change. I mean, change is always happening, but it was this crazy change in regards to music. Suddenly people were questioning things, questioning everything from sexuality to religion, and there was this crazy impact that was happening from the music scene. Just as the distortion and the dissonance in the guitar pedal was changing the actual tone of the music, this was changing everything from philosophy to ideals, and that's what we wanted to kind of start representing was the impact of music. So we have the literal walls coming down uh, there at, on that building. We have like the idea of women's rights, different things being impacted and changed by music. The next thing we started to study and analyze was typography. Uh, Jeremy Cox, a brilliant creative director here at the New York office, looked at, started looking into poster design and all these different flyers that would go up for different types of uh, venues of that day. And he broke that down and kind of deconstructed the different types of titles that had to go up there and created this poster for our pitch book. And this is a little motion test that they, uh, that they made for that. So yeah, really frenetic. You're starting to pick up on the influence that we're getting from the music and from the beats, you know, of all the things that the Stooges, the different types of bands that were happening in that day. And we started to begin to actually collect and create these kind of an understanding, right, of that, of that era. Um, 
this is, this is another thing that we do in life, what we do as designers and creators, is we look at our own personal experience when we're creating and curating and coming up with themes. One example for me when I was trying to think about this impact and dissonance and distortion of music was my own personal life. So this was me, look, long blonde hair in a rock band, and I go back to this memory. Fifteen years ago, right? Fifteen years ago, I had this weird, crazy experience of playing in a band, but it stuck with me that there was something when the guitars turned really loud and the drums are really slamming down. There was something to that that needed to be represented in this 90-second title for the 70s, because the fact is, even crazy, bizarre music like that would have never existed without these pioneers in that day. So always constantly looking at what inspires you, taking it seriously, and then collecting that and curating that into themes. That's a huge part of the creative process for me. Uh, secondly, honor intuition. There was this moment where I was at Imaginary Forces at working late at night, and I was trying to think to myself, how do we represent uh, this main character, this main producer, uh, for this character for the show, how I represent him in a way where you see the vibrations, and you see the sound, and you see him getting immersed within the music. Uh, and so I go up, uh, I'm walking through the kitchen, I get this really weird idea of taking a bag of flour from the kitchen, putting it on a table, and slamming my fist into it, and filming it with my iPhone at like, you know, 250 frames a second. So this was the test that I did that night, and I take it back to the computer, and I look at it, and I'm like, wow, there's something bizarre, there's something interesting about this idea of using particles and using uh, this different types of material as a way to represent vibration, right? So that was a huge thing. So I get on the phone after I'm having this weird idea from intuition, and I say, John, uh, he's our EP at the company, I said, I want to buy 120 pounds of flour, I want to buy a tarp, I want to tarp off the whole section of your pristine office space, and I want to baptize somebody in a sea of vibration. And there was a pause, and he said, I'll give you a hundred bucks, you better clean it up. <laughs> and that for me was like, that just goes and testifies to this idea of, how, of the type of people that I work with. They're very innovative and open thinkers. But guys, there's been so many times in the design process for me where I will have an idea like this, it'll come to mind, and I'll totally decide to just go looking and researching for references or hire some CG guy to make particles. And at the end of the day, this is what happened. This, this ended up being this next video uh, this is a, an editor friend of mine, Nate B uh, Buschnick, he's amazing. And I used him, he just came and showed up, and this helped us win, ultimately win the pitch with HBO, this portion. Sorry, there's a bit of audio playback. That was shot on my iPhone, literally Trader Joe's, 12 bags of flour, and a $30 tarp. And those became the interstitials within the sequence that made them start to understand that you can look at vibrations and you can look at um, this music scene in a different way, which takes me to my next point. Uh, the way you resuscitate a tired, bored, audience or whoever, whether it's watching television or walking down the road, the way you resuscitate them, the way I've found to be most successful is in the way we abstract and rearrange things. The things in life like a breakup or divorce or death or rock music, and you look at it and you twist it and you turn it and you repackage it in a way that they see it for the first time. They see it in a fresh way. You wake them up. And so I would say in our design process, always try to look for those opportunities to, to take something that's familiar and show it in a new and a fresh way. So you get all of these different scenes. We took that idea with flour, and we created these microscopic, looking at them from a very microscopic level. We found this scientist from the 1970s, which was perfect, because we're dealing with the 70s. And he creates these things called cymatics, which is like visual representation of sound. And he just, he just took this apparatus, put a speaker underneath it, and put lycopodium powder on top of it. And that's like, this really fine uh, stuff that comes from spores, from moss spores. And it's really fine, and when you play music under it, it creates this insane, geometric, bizarre-looking sound, like uh, uh, formations that begin to be the building block for us, and almost, you see almost like the gesture, like, you almost see like mosh pits turning around in there. It really started to speak to this idea of what was happening with the distortion pedal and with rock music. 
So from there, we decided to think, well, how can we actually change the, the format of what we're filming? How can we actually make that feel as if it's being deconstructed and falling apart and affected? So we got the Super 8 camera for the pitch. This is our editor, Jessica. And we just I went outside in the uh, you know, back alley in New York and just started filming. And you start to see how the actual grain is breaking apart, just like with the photocopied posters and typography that we were using. Everything is kind of breaking and deconstructing from the impact of the music itself. So these were tests that we did. And guys, to the testimony of HBO, because they're such a prestigious network, they looked at these tests and they were like, that's awesome, let's do it. It was, for me, it, was, it, it just testifies to how creative and great they are. HBO also came to us and was like, guys, I know the show is called Vinyl, but how can we represent the record player? And I didn't want to do that initially. You know, I, I, wanted, I love this idea of abstraction. It felt too on the nose. But one other huge rule I feel like when we use abstraction and rearrangement to show an idea is always remember that universal clarity is so important. Because you have heard before, like, if you can explain it to your grandmother and she can get it, that's like a good litmus, right? It's not always just designers watching these TV shows. So we decided, OK, if we're going to show a record player, let's look at it from a microscopic perspective. And we found these reference images. So awesome. It's like where the needle is banging against the left and right channel. And it's so violent, and it's so visceral, and it's so just gritty and raw. And it went perfectly in with the theme that we were looking for for the show. This expanded more and more. We wanted to go jar, you know, like jetting through the New York City subways. We obviously couldn't do that in the 1970s, so we had to, couldn't find stock for that. So we had to create all of these things in CG. Um, we had the buildings bursting apart, exploding apart, all the different influence of impacts. And then finally, and you can see here, this is just kind of a collection of all of this work that we did in behind the scenes to bring this all together. And I'll show you this little montage. Cool. So at the end of the day, we didn't want to people to see rock and roll as it was. We didn't want them to see the textbook example of what it was. At the end of the day, when we created this title, like all evocative storytelling and like all cutting edge design, we wanted them to feel rock and roll. And that was our goal. So thank you so much. Creative control is across, it's, it can be as a, a little or a lot. I will say we, we really gravitate towards main title design because they, almost of all the job types of jobs that we do, these are the people that are most open to amazing creati creative ideas. And HBO, I couldn't have asked for a better, like, better client. We would come in with these crazy ideas of, like I said, their show is shot so beautifully, and like we were bringing in this imagery that was shot on Super 8 film that's like falling apart and grainy, and they absolutely loved it. So jobs like this, it can be great, but just like any, any, any job, sometimes it can be you know, where the showrunner or director doesn't want to pull their hand back much, which is fine as well. You know, it's always good to collaborate. Yeah, so for this particular title, I at first wasn't even, I didn't even think I was gonna be involved. So what they did, they had a screening of the pilot, uh, Scorsese's like two hour pilot that you could go and watch privately. 
So I didn't even get to see that, but I did get the scripts, like the first few seasons of scripts. There are a lot of examples, though, of titles where we do get the first few shot seasons. Sometimes you have very little because directors want to work with you way before the show's even <coughs> starting. So it, it always varies. Now, if you see title design sometimes actually uses stuff from the film itself, from the title itself, sometimes those become interstitials and they are completely untreated and it feels connected to the show. But really, for the most part, I feel like with, with good title design, this is what a director or showrunner typically wants. They want you to take something that feels completely connected, feels completely um, of, the style, of the nature of the show, but then they want you to repackage it and, 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 and make it separate enough that it feels like almost like a poetic retelling of it. It's almost like I've heard a de title design described like uh, the cover of a book, right? You only get that, we get sometimes 90 seconds, 45 seconds for Stranger Things, sometimes even shorter. You, you know, for a title of a book, you just have that front cover, but it's a way to capture the tone and the mood and that, the essence of that show in a really short amount of time. So to answer your question, sometimes they do want that to look exactly, but most of, all, most of, most of the time they want it kind of like an abstracted, poetic type retelling of it. Yeah. That's a great question. Do I, do I always want to do title design? Uh, I, I am fully aware of the bubble that I am in <laughs> in title design. <laughs> I, I have to be passionate and up here and talking in such a way like I, I am completely oblivious. But the fact is I do understand, no, as a kid I didn't grow up and say, oh, I want to do a title. I didn't say I want to do commercials. <laughs> I wanted to be Scorsese making the films. That's, that's kind of like what I grew up wanting to do is I love telling stories. and. What's, what's great is you know, when those opportunities of doing longer formats don't come, it's really great when you get to work alongside of these people and create things that in a compacted, short little way, right? And I've grown to like really fall in love with it. I feel like there's this freedom with my schedule. I'm not like doing, this isn't a 10 year project, you know, it's a shortened schedule. And yet still I'm able to be like creative and, and it's exciting for me, especially when it's attached to a show that's, that you love, that's good. Like Stranger Things is a great example of that, right? It's like, and Mad Men, you attach it to something that's really beautiful and that's a cool collaborative thing. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks.